I am doing a book right now, and the book is called The Rise of the Seventh and Eighth Kingdom. The last chapter in that, well, chapter 15 in The Rise of the Seventh and Eighth Kingdom is the total collapse of society. And um, so, I mean, it really, it starts off with the Luciferian cult is the first ch chapter, and the ends with the total collapse of society, chapter 15. It is a good read. It's exciting, it is, I'm telling you. And it's just all laying it all right out, scripture upon scripture upon scripture upon scripture, just showing the whole evolution of the things that have taken place within the context of world events and governmental events. And I mean, I've been whole, I guess really I'm so excited about it. It's because I've been holding it on as, holding on to it as a, as a secret that I wasn't really, really, I wasn't really by the Lord to share with anyone. I mean, it was like, it was like, I think it was about six months ago, I whispered to somebody, said, you can't tell anybody. And then I kind of felt bad for doing that. And uh, then as like about two weeks ago, the Lord released me to do this. And it is radical. It is revolutionary. It's going to rock people's lives. It's going to, I think it's going to cause people to stand up and say, wait a minute, I'm having nothing to do with the demonic anymore. You know, and that's what I like about it most. You know, it really does draw a deep grand canyon between what goes on in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan and what, where we really are falling out and what side we're really standing on. And there's that big of a gulf between the two. So it's, it's that time. And so tonight I'm going to give you some overheads because I want to begin to talk to you about Mystery Babylon. I want to talk to you, which is Revelation chapter 17. I want to talk to you, and I began to talk to you a little bit about it last time we met. I'm going to talk to you more about ultimately literal Babylon, Revelation chapter 18. And, and to be able to really appreciate this, I've got to remove it from all the interpretation, modern day interpretation. And I've got to be able to somehow take everybody back and say, wait a minute, there's, honestly, Daniel did this in such a way the prophet Daniel did this in such a way, he, you don't have to have another book. He just laid it out there. All you have to have is a solid understanding of ancient history and how things went down. And um, so I, I'm, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not by and large going to go over all of the information that I went through uh, last time we met. However, it is so important as a foundation to really begin to grasp where it is that I'm going right now. But I'm going to take you back now in time to Daniel's day. And during the time, he lived in a time of the transition from the great Babylonian empire to the great media Persian empire. And um, during that period of time, the Lord unfolded to him all the events, governmental events that would take place, by and large, the bigger significant governmental events as they related to the nation of Israel, as they impacted the move of the kingdom of God between his day and the end of days when the, when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords comes back, fights against the armies of, of, of the governments of this world and completely eliminates and does away with all governmental powers and ultimately sets up his kingdom upon the earth, first and foremost for 1,000 years, where Christ Jesus reigns and brings all things into subjugation to the will of the Father, destroying the last enemy death. And then after that, at the end of the, that time, 1,000 years, once again, there is another great event where Satan is loose for just a short season upon the earth. And right after that, it is the final judgment the, or their, the earth and the, and the heavens are renovated by fire. They melt with a fervent heat. God creates a new heaven, a new earth, where he dwells in only righteousness. We are pressing towards that day where the Father comes down. All in all, of course, you know, I just quote or refer to a lot of verses of scriptures, but cornerstone verses of scripture that I'm referring to, of course, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 23 through, 23 through 25. But having said that, just kind of giving you a little bit of an overview. I'm going to just dump, jump right in with you now to help you understand the things that, that, that Daniel began to have revealed to him. He's like saying, Lord, why haven't we been able to go back to, the, uh, to, the, to, the, to our inheritance yet? Why haven't we been able to return to Israel? And we're, we're past the time. And, you know, the Lord began to show him all the things that were hindering. And what happened was God started off showing him a great image. And this great image has, of course, has been a key 
to most people's understanding of end time prophecy, most folks have left the beast that's standing there looking like a puppy dog that's lost um, with a lot of horns on its head uh, there to the right. And then, they've, and, then, and then the two beasts below are the beast of Revelation. And because, you know, that, that guy right there on the, on the right hand side is just really too weird to deal with. But I'm going to do my very best to make it real simple to you uh, by the help of the grace of the Lord tonight. And so um, I want, what I want to emphasize to you is I want to emphasize to you the rise of the seventh and the eighth kingdom. And so I'm just going to go right into that, that, that symbolism of that prophecy. So the first, uh, the first image that you see there, the image of this, of this uh, great um, uh, ruler, if you would, um, I have emphasized his, his legs and his feet for a purpose. And um, that is the vision that Daniel had in Daniel chapter 2. And the Lord just said, this is, these are the four great kingdoms that are going to rise up from this day. He says, and, and this is that interpretation that Daniel was able to give to Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar dreamed a dream and said, you got to tell me what a dream and give me in the interpretation of it. And all of his soothsayers and all of his magicians said, there's just an impossible request. Daniel walks in and mind, he just says in a, in, a, in a great oratory way, what's wrong with all the rest of you folks? I, you know, what's your problem? I got this covered. And I got it because the God of heaven has showed me. And here's what he showed me. He showed me the great ruling powers that are going to have the greatest impact between uh, uh, during this, this period, uh, period of time, that the, uh, the window of time that the Lord had locked Daniel into. God bracketed a window of time. And in this particular window of time, I'm just going to say this in short for everybody who is a little bit more advanced in prophecy, the window of time being the first 69 weeks of Daniel's vision and revelation of 670 weeks that are determined upon Israel, okay? And so, and, and of course, somebody says 69 weeks, 70 weeks, boy, that went by real quick. Well, each day representing a year and a time period, literally, of weeks of 69 weeks of weeks. So I'm just going to go right here with this giant figure here. And uh, it's all interpreted in Daniel chapter 2. This is no interpretation. And I wonder what I'm going to say is that there are those who believe that Daniel was written um, at, at a later date after all these things transpired because the prophecy is one of the most accurate and detailed prophecies of all the Bible. And so for people to look at that and go, wow, he prophesied all of this before it happened? Well, it can't be. Well, it was and it is and there's lots of proof for that. And so he said, God showed him four kingdoms that was going to rise up that was very important to him to understand within the framework of the first 69 weeks. And then he brought them ultimately to the 70th week, but that ultimately is something we're going to talk about here in a little, in, in, a little bit later. But number one is the head of gold. He says, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, great king, you are that head of gold. It's the kingdom of, of, of Babylon. And it's very important for us to grasp these kingdoms because there's something that's going to be important for us to understand about a relationship that goes on between these kingdoms. And then the, he said, then there, the, um, the arms are... Uh, uh, what, what represented Persia, the, the kingdom of the media of Persians. And then uh, you can see that the belly, the torso is a brass representing the kingdom of Greece. And then a fourth kingdom, the kingdom uh, of the Roman Empire. OK, we all know about the history of that to some degree. And then there's, there's going to be a relationship to these. OK. And ultimately where I want to take you is I want to take you to the, ten, the, to the feet, to the ten toes, because those ten toes are what the rest of those images are up about there. So I can tell you this, those other three images that you see are just going to be further explanation about the ten toes, okay? And, 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 and so I want to be able to flesh that out for you. I'm going to give you, by way of a background, I want you to understand the rebellion all began in uh, Mosul. Anybody heard of Mosul lately? Mosul, where all the where ISIL is right now, just basically running them down. Mosul ultimately became the first great king of Assyria's capital place. He named it. He named the, the region around it Nimrod. He had it's a different name, Nimrud or Nimrod, because the Assyrians really related to Nimrod, his religion, his cult of interacting with um, angels or what modern people began to call genies. Oh, you know, and they said that's myth mythology. They called them genies. It was a particular word that they used for these angel spirits that had a 
function with the wind, had a function with all the various different stars and hosts of heaven. And, um, and I've got so much to say about that. Ultimately, all of those things actually ended up just be they actually all of those things under the reign of Jeroboam ended up in the in the holy place in the temple. They ended up in the temple. It was jo, it was uh, Josiah who's the one who threw him down. OK, and I, I want you to understand there's a cult going on here. It's a Luciferian cult. Satan rebelled against God and in his rebellion, he absolutely captured, as it were, a dominion over man. And that rebellion has risen its head again and again. And God had to destroy the earth because the rebellion became so bad and the interaction with angels and men became so bad that the, they had polluted the human race to the point that no Messiah could ever come forth from the human race. God found eight souls whose genealogy was pure. OK, and the scripture says Noah was a righteous man who is perfect in his genealogies. Right. And I know that King James is perfect in his generation, but the word actually used there is a word more specific for that is a genetics term, genealogies, okay? Who your ancestry is. And, and um, you know, Satan wants to make what was, you know, has been fighting in every way he possibly can to prevent Christ Jesus from coming. I mean, try to over and again, we could talk about what Satan is trying to do to pre prevent the cross. He couldn't prevent the cross. And now he's doing everything he possibly can do to prevent people from seeing the cross and coming to the cross. So what I'm, what I'm getting at is Nimrod, then right after the flood, one of Ham's great grandsons was this guy named Nimrod. His father was the name of Cush. His, by the name of Cush, he, he, his, his uncle was named Mitzrayim. And Mitzrayim means Egypt. And, and um, you know, there's a whole lot of connectivity of what's going on. And when we look at ancient history and, and all those events that were taking place right then in, at, at that period of time. But, you know, uh, the Gilgamesh legends and, and other legends and myths that we have today actually come from that time period. And once again, we see a terrible disaster event where men are once again interacting with angels. And so when you read about ancient history and they're interpreting all of these various different um, images and gods that they worshiped, then you're going to see that they were they very much believed in interacting with angels. If they had wings, they always were always, always they were always showing their gods with wings and with horns, both of them representing divinity, the power that these are divine beings. And so ultimately, great God that Nimrod set up was a God called Bel. Bel ultimately came, became known in Egypt and the Phoenicians as Baal. And once again, they're, these, they're, the oldest images are all showing them as winged creatures, winged men. And then, you know, also, Let's just take it, think of, take it another place as, as different dimensions of cherubims, of, of faces of a lion, faces of, of, of an ox or a bull, and faces also of an eagle. And then remember, think about this with me. Think about this with me. When Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, are you with me? They were kicked out of the garden. God's going to now prevent them from the tree of life. And by the way, let me just say this. All of the legends and myth centered around the ancient cult of Nimrod, of, of ancient Babylonia, of ancient Assyria, all have everybody standing in front of the tree of life with some form of fruit in their hand, okay? Doing some certain postures like this, things that ultimately came out with, you see in, in other image of gods like Buddha, the Hindu gods of the, of the, of the uh, Vita, of the Sanskrit, I go on and on, but I don't want to get into all of that. But the bottom line of it is, they're, all of these religions are totally integrated. They came out of the northern mountains, the, the mountains of northern Iran, Iraq, right in the same region where Nineveh is, where the, the city of Nimrod is, where uh, Mosul, present day Mosul is, present day Nineveh, present day um, <clears throat> Baghdad. So I, I really want to show I want to show the connections because that's what Daniel does. He shows the connections of all of these kingdoms of how they're associated and integrated with one another. There's there's a religious practice. There's a belief. There is a there's a cultus centered around what every one of them did. 
that actually involved their power was derived from angels. They would call them, if you're trying to discern ancient Akkadian or if you're trying to discern ancient Eucharist, a Sumerian, they're going to be called spirits or demons or genies. And sometimes they're called, they're literally referred to as, as angels. But, but, you know, that basically gets clouded by all of, of, the, of, the, of the myths and the legends. And so, you know, everybody just backs away from that. So fine, back away from it. Let me take you to Genesis. For 1,556 years, for 1,500, what, 1,500, forgive me, 1,565 years, sometimes, or wait, was it 1,556 years? I'm pretty sure that's it, right around in there. They were actually interacting with angels. And I'm going to show you how they were interacting with angels, not just on the perspective of Genesis chapter 6, where angels actually came and had relationships with the daughters of men and produced a very unique non human race. But reality of it is, is when God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden, he placed a cherubim there to guard the way. You can understand cherubims by looking at what Ezekiel described them to be. That's that great tall creature, the about 40 feet high, face of a lion, face of an eagle, face of a man, face of an ox, who has beside him a wheel inside of a wheel full of eyes. And wherever the wheel goes, they, so the cherubim goes, they move like the speed of lightning. They look like lightning because they move at the speed of light when they do move. Radical creatures. And they had, each one had one arm coming out from under each wing and, uh, and, and in the hand there was a flaming sword and there was no way of getting near them, okay? And people want to make them spaceships and everything. These angels, they're spaceships, these are angels, cherubim angels. Now, for 1,556 years, 1,556 years, men are interacting with this creature, these cherubims. Why? Because the garden was still there. Why? Because Adam was still alive. Are you with me? At least for 900 and how old is Adam? 940? Right, guys? For at least for 940 years, the garden was still there being protected so Adam couldn't go back in. He knew, the, he knew where it was at. Are you with me? There's all kinds, of, uh, all kinds of reason to believe in ancient history, folklore, myth, legend, that people knew about that place. And that's why in all the walls of the ancient Babylonians and all the walls of the ancient Assyrians and all the walls of the ancient Egyptians, they're all relating to the tree of life. It even got into Celtic religion many, many years later of the people of, of England, of Ireland, of, you know, of Germany. The same images ended up on their wall. And you say, ah, oh, it's just myth, it's just make-believe. No, 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 no. We aren't the first generation that's got any kind of clue. In fact, we're probably less intelligent than they were. I'm telling you, we're probably far less perceptive than they were. We're far more consumed with a, with a, with a small world that isn't really reality because we live in a little box and we get in a little box and drive to work and get back in our, and get, go, to go into a little box, to leave our little box at work, to get back in our little box, to drive back to our box where we live. Okay, and that's the world we live in. And they lived in a very different world. They were interacting constantly with nature and with the, and with the, and the, with the surrounding atmosphere. And their senses were very m much different than ours. They were, in, they, they, were far much, they were much closer to interacting with the spirit world. If you go into third world countries, I think one of the things, the advantage in a third world country to preaching the gospel is that people there are far more sensitive to the spirit world. They're dealing with demons all the time. And they have no problem de de dealing with demons and talking about demons and knowing how real demons are. The reality of it is is somebody tells them, wait a minute, Christ Jesus, the King of heaven has come run off every devil and now everybody's excited. You're kidding me. I want to get free of this devil. You ought to see what we had to go through last week to get rid of the devil out of the village who came and killed two babies in the village. You tell them devils aren't real. Okay, now see, this is a pretty radical thing. We are totally removed from all of that. And our anthropologists and archaeologists want to tell us, oh, leave them alone, let their culture survive, as though it's something sacred, you know. But we're not going to get into that tonight either. I'm really making the point of how that reality of it is, is there was always this, this interaction, this mentality of those people that are what we would call pre-flood people, antediluvian people, that ultimately um, were very sensitive and, and very interactive with the angelic world, fallen angels. 
And also, as I pointed out, you know, at least one of God's company of angels, the cherubims. Now, after the flood, Nimrod raises up and he's going to build a ziggurat, a tower, a temple. OK, not like we would think of Oh, he's building a little tower up to heaven and, you know, it's going to go all the way to the throne of God. And God says, we got to stop them because if we don't stop them, there's nothing going to be prevented from them. And, you know, and of course, then in Sunday school, we got them going up past the clouds all the way up into the very throne. Well, we realize that that's just simply not any real picture of what went on because we know they wouldn't have got up too far and they would all died from black fox. The reality of it is he was building a tower, a ziggurat, a temple of worship, a place that would contain the gods, the angels, the only angels that we read about right now, a place that the angels would be willing to dwell. The only place that we read about angels being bound right now are two places in the pit and in the river Euphrates. And the ones that are bound in the pit, we, all, we know from Jude and from uh, Peter that they are the ones who left their first habitation and went and cohabitated with men. Those guys were bound in the pit. There's going to be one of those angels that is going to be released from the pit. One of them will be released from the pit. The only angels that are bound in the pit are the angels that sinned either before the flood or after the flood in a very unique way. There's only one of those angels that are going to be released from the pit and he's going to come and he's going to rule in the seventh and the eighth kingdom, which are represented by that to those, to those, uh, those ten toes. Everybody, everybody from Nimrod to, to the Pharaohs, Pharaohs, they were divine. They were God kings. Uh, Nimrod believed he was a God king. Pharaoh believed he was a God king. And everybody else believed he was God king. And he had some powers to show with it. Assyrian, God king. They all believed that they had an angelic power. They had with them the, the forces of the heavens to give them the power that they had to conquer the world. Where, and then we move from Egypt to Assyria, from Assyria to Babylon. They all believed that they were under the influence of the divine power that would, uh, was greater than all other gods and all other powers. Same way that Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, Great believed that he was the seed of the serpent. He was proud about being the seed of the serpent. He did not believe that his father was Philip. He believed that his father was Zeus, another name for Baal or Baal. And once again, these, they, they depicted these guys as angels, winged creatures, okay? And so, um, you know, Having said all of that, I'm now wanting to take and I want to integrate the kingdom of Nimrod with what I'm going to say here. Nimrod created Babylon. Genesis chapter 10 and 11. He's the guy who he's the one who created the first kingdom among men in the Bible. And in doing so, he created this religion that ultimately became a part of the religion of every empire, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome. I'm showing that in my book in, in the, in the rise of, that I'm calling the rise of the seventh eighth kingdom. These these powers are integrating uh, the governmental powers of men in such a way that we are able to maybe look a little bit closer at exactly how Satan is influencing governmental powers. OK, and so it's important to recognize that when we begin to talk about these kingdoms, what's common about them and why, is, why they're being revealed to Daniel is number one is because of their impact on Israel as a nation to influence Israel, to stop Israel, to, to try to destroy Israel. And there were two kingdoms before them. And the two kingdoms before them was Assyria and, and Egypt. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. But what I want to really emphasize to you right now is I want to emphasize to you the four kingdoms that are that that ultimately um, Daniel begins to focus on. So give me the next slide real quickly. And then we're going to come back to this one. Not that one. The next one. These four kingdoms. Now, these four kingdoms are highlighted for us in Daniel chapter seven. And the first uh, kingdom, the kingdom that is represented by a lion, that's the Babylonian kingdom, these four kingdoms, okay? Babylonian kingdom. That's the same as the head of gold right there. The next one is the kingdom of the bear, represented by the, 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 the arms and breast of silver. That's the Babylonian empire, okay? The, for, forgive me, Persian, Medo-Persian empire. The third one is that leopard with four heads and wings, okay? 
And then the fifth one is the one that's way back there in the background. He's the terrible beast with ten horns. We're going to talk more about the terrible beast. I just wanted you to see here's another way to symbolize the Babylonian, the Medio Persian, the Grecian, and the Roman Empire in the back. Okay? But the, the one in the back is a little bit unique when we're talking about the Roman Empire because we got to talk about two dimensions of, of that, of that creature. Now, go back, to the, go back to the first slide, okay? Now, just what I want you to see here is I want you to see that beast that's described there in Daniel, the fourth beast that's described there in Daniel chapter 7, the terrible beast. I'm not going to focus on the lion. I'm not going to focus on the bear. I'm not going to focus on the leper with four heads, which represents the Grecian or Alexander the Great's empire. And, 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 you know, once again, I'm not just, just throwing names out there. These things are provable for, for you from Scripture. But this terrible kingdom. Now, the terrible beast, he represents the legs of this uh, image over here who has two legs of iron. That's the old Roman Empire. But what happens is out of the Roman Empire comes ten horns. Those ten horns are just like the ten toes. Are you with me? Yeah. Out of that comes ten horns. Now, what we realize is that out of one of those horns comes a little horn that is the Antichrist. He's the one who creates and speaks grace, blasphemy against God. He's the one that God will come and destroy with the breath of his nostrils. He's the one that is featured at the Battle of Armageddon. You can read it right there in Romans chapter 7. I'm not going to take the time to read it. But as you read it, you say, wow, whoever this terrible beast is, that's the kingdom. And so what we, what we have to do is what we got to grasp here is that these ten horns are coming up out of one kingdom. They're not coming out of, a, up a, out of a bunch of different kingdoms. If you remember last time we were together, I helped you understand from Revelation chapter 17 that the heads of, of these beasts represent kingdoms, okay? And, you know, we read in Revelation chapter 17, the seven heads are seven kings, uh, seven mountains upon which seven kings sit. We already know that mountains throughout the Bible represent kingdoms. And then I'm give you, I'll give you one of the first clues. It's not actually the first time that this re a mountain represents a kingdom, but it's one of the first clues to mountains representing kingdoms are seen right there with that image, that, that image of the man right there, the image of that great king. Because what happens is during the reign of that great, uh, uh, during that, that image uh, existence, Daniel shows in Daniel chapter two, there's a stone cut out without hands in heaven. And that stone is thrown out of heaven and it hits or strikes the image right in the feet, right in the toes. And God then describes to us in the book of Daniel that this is then the kingdom of God, which ultimately destroys the governments of men and then grows into an exceeding high mountain. And so the kingdom of God, there's one of the very clear places representing um, represented by a mountain, displacing all the kingdoms of the world. So when you get to Revelation chapter 17, nothing's changed about the imagery of a mountain. And even if you were confused about the imagery of a mountain, the Lord then goes on to say, these seven mountains are seven kings. Okay, and he makes it very, very, very clear. And he says, five are fallen, one is, and one is yet to come. That's Revelation chapter 17, right? I'm review for you, right? Five are fallen. What five had fallen? Assy Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media Persia, Greece. One is, what, what kingdom existed during the days of John? Rome. And one shall rise up afterwards. Okay? Now, keeping those things in mind, we see, this, we see four, four images that are representing four kingdoms that are part of the Daniel time period, if you would. Okay? One of them was a lion, Babylon. One of them was a bear, Media Persia. One of them, a leper with four heads, Greece. One of them, this terrible beast, Rome. It's Rome. Say it's Rome. Rome. It's Rome. But it's not Rome because it can't be Rome because this kingdom exists in the last day is the one that God destroys when he comes to set up his kingdom. But it is Rome, but it's not Rome. So what, what am I saying? I'm saying that out of the beast came forth Ten kingdoms, ten kings represented by ten horns this time again. And I know we're going to go show you the same symbolism in 
Revelation chapter 13 and Revelation chapter 17. God shows the 10 horns come up out of one beast to help us understand, wait a minute, these 10 kings that have 10 kingdoms ultimately emerge from a specific geographical location from a specific empire so we can begin to understand that. Give me the next slide, the map. Okay, this is the ancient Roman Empire. Right now, the ancient Roman Empire probably consists of 27 nations. Okay, 27 nations. Something's gonna happen. Those 27 nations aren't gonna exist anymore. They're gonna turn into 10 kingdoms. Okay, they're gonna turn into 10 kingdoms ruled by 10 kings. Now for that to happen, there has to be a, a major world war for that to take place. That's how we know that in this region right here, this is a hot spot. We, prophetically, we know that when all of a sudden you see a struggle, they're in, I'm gonna tell you right now, Germany's not gonna turn its power over to France or vice versa, okay? Britain's not gonna go over to, to uh, Holland and say, look, we wanna be governed with you by you. By, you know, by you from here on out. And, and all the other nations that are part, Poland isn't going to go over and say, guys, hey, Ireland, please reign over us. For it to form 10 kingdoms ruled by 10 kings. Where do you know kings ruling at right now? Africa, okay? <laughs> Rare places on the planet. Are you with me? Yeah. We're talking about a very different world that is soon to happen and must take place before Christ Jesus comes to, to ultimately overthrow the armies and the governments of this world. How far, long is that in the making? See, so what I want to do is we, if you go back and you start reviewing what I've given you up to this point, you're going to see, I'm going to show you hot spots. I showed you the hot spot of what's going to happen in the Middle East among Edom. What's going to happen in, in, in Moab and what's going to happen in, in the various different re regions right now of Syria, etc. Also, let's look over here and now get a focus also not only on those areas, but, but Europe as well. Okay? Reaching up there into Turkey and all the way over to uh, England and Germany and France and, you know, Spain and the northern horn of Africa. Are you with me? Can you imagine the changes that are going to take place? One of the things that I like to do is I like to say, because I know where I know where the Antichrist comes from. I know his system of religion. I know the things that are surround him. He's just Nimrod was a perfect type of him. Sargon II was a perfect type of Antichrist. Sennacherib shares certain interests that are similar to the Antichrist, but no one was a perfect type of the Antichrist like Nimrod and then Nebuchadnezzar, who actually goes and builds an image and says, fall down and worship me. Who's going to do that? And the Antichrist is going to build an image and say, all the world to fall down and worship the image. And if you don't worship the image and take the image's mark, he's going to take it to another level. Because what's going to happen is it's going to go to another level because of the magnitude of the interaction of the fallen angelic world of Satan's power. He's going to, give the, he's going to make the image actually live and speak. <laughs> and so, pretty radical, isn't it? This is pretty, pretty, pretty radical. Okay, are you guys, I'm getting ready. God doesn't show us things in his word just to humor us. He shows us for those of us who are purposed to see, and that should be anybody who's willing to hunger and, and thirst after righteousness. This is what's going to happen. I'm showing you so you can get ready, so you can prepare, so that you can do the things in ministry that need to be done in an in, 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 in event of all these issues taking place. Okay. Are you with me? I want to, I want to, point I want to make with this slide. This is the major change that's going to happen in all of Europe. I love to take the, I like to take maps like ancient empire of, of Egypt, show you the region. By and large, I, I personally believe that's what Egypt is actually going to look like when Antichrist comes to get it. And I do the same thing with Syria, ancient Syria, ancient, ancient Greece ancient Turkey, and, um, but reality of it is no matter where we're looking, we're seeing commonality. We're seeing commonality of belief, commonality of worship, commonality of, of 
the, 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 the things that were going on within the framework of their governmental power now and their effect on Israel. Was there, was there any kingdom that messed with Israel as a nation before Egypt? No, the answer is no, because Israel came into existence during the time of Egypt, the Egyptian empire. You with me? Yeah. Okay. And so when we begin to look at seven heads, every time you see seven heads, you're looking at seven kingdoms. Mm -hmm. Every time you see seven heads, you're looking at seven kingdoms. What are you looking at? You're looking at Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, Rome, and then the seventh, from which also comes the eighth. You with me? Okay, back to the other slide, please. First one. Now, so what we see is 10 horns come up out of this beast up here. And you see in the middle, there's one horn has got a crown. He's got the mouth. He subdues three of them right off the bat. What's going to happen is now in Daniel chapter 8, God's going to show Daniel something more about this particular horn. Uh, little horn, and I'm going to come back to him in just a minute. I don't want you to go there now. I'll come back to him in just a minute. I just want you to know that little horn means Antichrist. That little horn means the last kingdom that stands upon the face of the earth in the last day. It means the eighth kingdom. It's the one that, that everybody talks about in terms of the battle of Armageddon. That's where it's all going down. And he puts those horns right out of that one beast so that we know its geographical location. Now, the next beast I want to show you is this beast that comes out of the sea of humanity, out of the sea in Revelation chapter 13. This one right down here in the left-hand column. This, once again, how many heads does he have? Seven heads, okay? Because he's connected, once again, he's connected with all of the religious system, cultic system, and oppression of the kingdom, trying to stop the kingdom of God, the advancement of God's people, the things that God is doing in the earth, that's what brings connectivity between all of these kingdoms. Once again, you see 10 horns coming up out of one of the heads, okay? And this time, it's a leopard. And there's a reason being because the Antichrist kingdom is represented by a leopard, but he has the mouth of a, of a lion. Why? Because there's also various different elements of the Babylonian kingdom. Where did the Babylonian kingdom start? Nimrod. It's where it all began. That's where the rebellion began after, after Noah. If I could get you to just remember that. Say the rebellion began after Noah with Babylon. And the rebellion ends with the Antichrist in Babylon. Same kingdom. That is, look, people, that is no coincidence. Are you with me? And that's why we've got to grab a hold of, of the religious system, the belief system, the practice, the goal, the purpose. What was this all about? <laughs> Somebody said, oh, you know, it's going to be it's going to be the, the, the Mohammedist Islam because they behead. Nobody beheaded like the Assyrians. When you depict Assyrians, you depict the conquerors either with a pile of heads in front of them or with a big stick poking out the eyes of kings and champions. They were ruthless. They, when they wanted to mess with, when, when they took you over, they reached in your mouth and jerked your tongue out of your mouth. They were ruthless. <laughs> okay. Nazarbanapal, right? That's how you pronounce his name, right? It's a tough one, right? First great king. He defined Assyria. And he do, he's the one who built the great monument and city to Nimrod because he, his, his whole idol, his whole God, his whole religious worship system was all about the same gods, Baal, B-E-L, Baal, who was the God of this world. And he was called the God of this world. He was literally called the prince of the power of the air, who ultimately also became known as Baal. Come on, think about this, people. And these gods haven't gone nowhere. Just because we don't think, we think we're so bright and intelligent and we're not superstitious, I'll tell you right now. They, they do in their work because they do the same thing. The religious practice was to get people drugged up intoxicated and to bring them into all kind of lewd sexual immorality. That's how you worship these guys. 
and you had to get drunk and intoxicated so you could be sensitive to their influence because that was the only way they could ultimately reduce you to such immorality, to such unclean and unbelievable immoral practices that there would be no way that man at that time had the ability to even be that immoral. But it's everywhere now. And now, uh, now these fallen angels, Satan has created for him a system. Boy, he gets the word out quick. He's got an internet. And you know, I'm, I'm telling you, dear people, I, I pray earnestly, I pray, I pray desperately that the satellites fall out of the sky. And they will. They're coming down. They're coming down. They're coming down. And, and, and it's an act of God's mercy. People say, oh, we want to do intergalactic travel. You ain't going to get it. It's coming to it's coming, The system's coming down. So, it's very important to recognize, uh, once again, that when we see the ten horns of this beast with seven heads come up out of the sea, that John's talking about, we recognize that once again, it is connected, it is attached with all of the six kingdoms that are before it, and its primary purpose is the same, to fight against the saints, to stop the kingdom of God, to, to direct the focus of its attack against Israel as a nation. That's it. Okay? Now then we're going to see this whore. And she's got her cup in her hand. What's her cup? What's in her hand? A cup. What is this cup? It's blood. What did the ancient cults of, of, of Samaria, of ancient Babylonia, and of Syrians represent? They drank blood. But they not only drank blood, they drank wine that represented blood. And they had to imbibe this intoxicant in order to be able to participate with the lewd and immoral acts that those fallen angels demanded. That, and, and some of those actual interactions, the women who were the prostitutes, the Kadesh of that day, which were being sanctified to the gods to go and have interrelationship, inter, in, in, relationships with them. Are you listening to me? Because I want to stop immorality. I want to I want to get people to recognize that the same fallen angels, that the same demon spirits are doing the same thing. When you pull up stuff on the on the Internet, when you get yourself involved with the things that are going on, when you're pulled into sexual immorality, it's the same angelic host. It's the same demon power directed and focused for the same purpose and reason. And I got to get people to wake up because folks are dead asleep. And if you can understand what's really going on, my goodness gracious, people think that God is on the side of that. I'm telling you, there is a grand canyon between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God. And this is why, this is the only reason I like to teach prophecy. I want people to understand what's revealed in the midst of prophecy. I want you to see where it's going. Satan believed he took over it during the days of Adam. And he believes he owns it to this very day. And he believes at the end he'll also overthrow God and retain it and keep it. And in the meantime, he's going to torment every man and drag every man into the pit of hell and into his prison because all he is is death and destruction. And all these gods were, is, were all they were and all they were about was death and destruction. What is the, why is the whore riding upon this king? Who is she? She is the idolatrous religious system. That's who she is. She's the re idolatrous religious system that Nimrod instituted when he was building a tower to enter into the spiritual realm so that there, nothing would be prevented that they wanted to do. All they wanted to do was interact with the demon spirits. They wanted to interact with the angels that would give them power and ability to overthrow God himself. Nimrod was a hunter of men, not lions and tigers and bears. He hunted, hunted men that he would bring all men under slavery. So he went and hunted men to all the known regions of the earth that day, had gathered them all together in a small geographical location called Babylon. Pretty radical, isn't it? Huh? You're listening to me. This is what the Bible says. This is what God has revealed. If I, I, I want to get people to burn with the same kind of passion, man, I can't get anybody's attention. It's like all oh, the world is just running in this huge, you know, trance right off the cliff into hell. And, and you're screaming and hollering, saying no. They, and what's worse is they think they're riding on the way to heaven. You're saying no. Can't you see what God's been saying from Genesis chapter 1 all the way to Revelation 22? You do these things and you'll be destroyed. You got to understand who's behind this. This woman, this religious system, 
Right now in my book, The Rise of the Seventh Day Kingdom, I'm tracing, showing how that when God came down and intervened and stopped what Nimrod was trying to do and scattered the people upon the face of the earth by dividing their languages, the first thing that begins to emerge as is, is the empire, the Egyptian empire, as they begin to build their ziggurats in a very unique way, the pyramids. Once again, containing the gods, Pharaoh emerges as a god king. The same religious practices, God, uh, the, the, Ra, ultimately, and, and as I said, Baal, who replaced Baal. Just another way of saying the same name. Ultimately, what was behind that was this whore. She represents demon power. She's the one who is always persecuting the saints. She's the one who turned them in, who, who basically sorely afflicted Israel, making them slaves in Goshen and demanded that all of the firstborn of the Hebrew children be destroyed. That's her. She is the one that demands that men come and worship her and bow down before her. She is epitomized sexual immorality. She epitomizes intoxication. She epitomizes rage. That's who she is. She's drinking the blood of the saints and she's happy about it. And she's a harlot. In other words, she's not, she's not a prostitute. She don't sell it. She gives it and demands it to be given to her. That is her cultus. She demands people to get into immorality. She, is, she was expressed as Isis. She was expressed as um, Diana. She was expressed as uh, Artemis. She was expressed as Esther. There's all these various different names for her. She's the cultist of idolatry. Really, angels showed, look, angels showed men, make this image and through this image, you can get to me over here on the other side. In other words, through your interaction with idols, through this interaction and this practice that we give you, you can now have control over demons. So the great scholars of the past said that literally religion, the basis of religion was the sorcery and the magic that was around it. That was the whole creation of religion. Outside of Bible, when you look at it secularly, it was the magic, it was the witchcraft. In other words, it was the sorcery. It was, it was the being able to have power over the angel like a genie in a bottle. It was to be able to have demon spirits go and kill somebody for you. It was to be able to give the, 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 the supernatural world, to, to, to get the supernatural world to bring power upon you so that you could subjugate man. And it, the, listen, there's all kinds of stuff trying to stop what I'm saying. The good news is this. And nothing can stop the word of God. Men have done all that they've done against God in a spirit called rebellion. And it pervades everywhere. And when you suddenly recognize it and you can see it in its manifestation in the garden and you can see it in the manifestation throughout the places where it plagued humanity in the Bible and you ultimately can see how it's trying to influence you, you'll become at war against it. And that's why people like me are not very popular. If you want to category, categorize me as in some kind of a category where you can discount me. They want to try to find some way to discount me. Satan takes people like me and does anything he possibly can do to discredit them. And he's used tactics in ways that has caused a lot of men of God to fall. What happens when you come through on this thing on the other side as gold tried in the fire? I tell you, I am at war against the devil, against Satan, against demon spirits. I'm at war against him. And, and Father has given me an authority over demon spirits and I can spot them a long ways off. And I'm going to tell you right now, dear people, I pray in Jesus' name, you'll be able to spot these things as they're coming down, especially as they're going to try to influence you. Because the purpose of demon spirits is to take you out, to destroy you. You listen to me. You listen. Mom and dad, you better watch your houses. Because Satan is ruthless. He's going to take your kids. Listen, if I, could just, if I could just grab a hold of the young people of this age and say, you don't understand. You are bowing down to worship a God when you're involved in all the stuff that's going on. They're sexting, sending, sending text messages that have sexual uh, content to it. They're doing all kinds of crazy things. 
You know, people are telling, we're, we're hearing stories about where people can be involved in every kind of sexual immorality and still be virtuous because, you know, they, you know, did, did the sexual thing as a sex, called sexual favors. They're just like patting one another on the back and it's just, no, you need to listen, you need to shut your ears up, close your eyes. It's bad, bottom line of it, it's going down in the church. And here I stand up here preaching my head off while I got a bunch of saints resisting me while meanwhile people are dying and going to hell all around us right in the context of the meeting where people could have been delivered from demon spirits. Instead, they were rebellious because they gave place to rebellion and thus were snared by Satan. If you walk with God, he will deliver you from evil. If you submit yourself to God, he will deliver you from evil. You'll never be taken out by the powers of Satan. The only way Satan can fulfill his sin in you is somewhere. Somewhere you have to submit to him. And it's usually rebellion. It's usually disobedience. The disobedience of rebellion. There's plenty of it. Once again, you look at the beast he's riding. Okay, seven heads, but the seventh out of the seventh rises up ten horns. And out of those ten horns, those ten horns are always showing us about the Antichrist and where he's coming from. And this Antichrist is going to be ruled over by an angel that will come up out of the pit. I read that to you last time we got together. Can you help him? Can you just help him? Just pray in the Holy Ghost or something. I mean, I can handle it for like two or three, four, five, 10, 20 minutes. But then, then, you know, it's just, it's hard for people to listen to the recording of it, of this. It's hard for people to really to hear sometimes on the web because the microphones pick up higher pitches better than uh, lower pitches. So I just, I want everybody to be in on this. It's just at some point we have to consider everybody else more than ourselves, right? Okay. And so I'm, I'm, look, I'm happy for the hunger. I just got, I got to get you guys to grab a hold of something. When you see the 10 horns, it's all about helping us understand the Antichrist who he is and where he comes from, the context from which he arises. This is so important because then we're not running over here looking and running over there looking. Meanwhile, that's Satan's greatest strategy to distract you, to run interference, to say, oh, I'm over here, or I'm over there. Meanwhile, he's fully developing his plan where you're not even looking. Right. And that is fundamental to being successful on the battlefield. And it was, it was Satan that ultimately taught men these things. When you look in Revelation chapter 12, in Revelation chapter 13, Satan comes down out of the realm of heaven. He's now no longer invisible, in other words. He's laid out before men. Men are able to see him. He's going to do everything he does through his surrogates, as it were. One angel that is, are going to be seen. He said, oh, I can't believe angels and a fallen angel are going to be seen. Well, angels of God, angels of heaven, are going to be flying through the air, screaming out to man the everlasting gospel. So if you can see the angels of the Lord, what's so, what is so dramatic? What is so impossible that suddenly the veil is off and you can also see fallen angels as well? Because fallen angels have now power that they never had before. God will give them power to overcome the saints. They're going to be taking heads through men. If you do not take their mark, if you do not take the image, image the mark of the image, and, and it's the only way it can possibly even be understood is, is just the number of a man. It's, it's man worship. It's man, it's humanism. <laughs> it's we will rule ourselves. We do not want you. We are united together as one voice. That's why Nimrod's a perfect antichrist. That's why Alexander the Great is a perfect antichrist. He wanted to unite the whole world under the doctrines and belief system of, of the Grecian Empire so that he could free the whole world through this unity of knowledge. That was his thing. That's why he's a perfect antichrist. That's why when the antichrist is, per, is perfectly typed, he's always typed in terms of Alexander the Great the Grecian Empire. So go to the next slide. That's him. This, now I'm talking to you from uh, Daniel chapter 8 again. And in Daniel chapter 8, what we see is we see a um, ram. And now, you know, you say, well, 
the symbolism is really jumping around. Yeah, but the good news is that we're constantly being getting feedback from, from Daniel exactly what the symbolism represents so we don't lose track here. Now, ba the Babylonian Empire does not, uh, forgive me, the Medio Persian Empire does not is not represented by arms and a chest of silver. Now the Medio Persian Empire is not represented by a bear with three ribs in its mouth. Now the Medio Persian Empire is represented by something very unique. A ram. And now this ram comes up against the Grecian Empire, which is not represented in this time at this instant in time as, as a torso of brass. But as nor is he represented as a leper with four heads. I'm gonna, I can tell you why he's these are represented this way, but that's for later. Okay? Now he's represented as a goat. And the two meet. Okay? And the he goat overthrows the ram and kills the ram and casts the ram down and stomps him to death. The Alexander the Great's kingdom. Nothing, no one killed Alexander the Great. So in the prophecy, what happens is we see his horn is broken off. And out of his horn, the horn that is broken off, four horns come up. See the four horns? And one of them is the little horn that you constantly see with those other ten horns. This little horn, the same little horn that you've seen in the terrible beast. Turn it back for a minute. This terrible beast right up here to the right. See the terrible beast of, of Daniel chapter 7? Same little horn that came up in the midst of the ten horns. Now turn back. Is the same horn that comes up here. What is God doing? It's like, it's, like, it's like he's taking us and he's now showing us a kind of a global picture. And now he's going to zero down and he's going to focus in and cause us to see exactly where this little horn is. He's allowing us first to see the context in which he arises. The ten kingdoms. He rises out of the ten kingdoms that rises out of the ancient Roman Empire. A complete reconstruction of how governmental power and, and nations interact with each other. Now he's going to bring it into focus a little bit closer and he's going to show us four kingdoms. He's going to show us Turkey. He's going to show us ancient Macedonia, ancient Greece. It's more than just little, the little island of Greece. Okay? It goes all the way over to the Serbs, folks. Okay, are you with me? Where there's a, bottle, a lot of trouble in, 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 um, in, 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 in Bosnia and all along the Aegean. Are you with me? Yeah. You understand? Yeah, yeah. You understand how big Macedonia was ancient Macedonia. That's the context in which we've got to look. Syria and Egypt. The little horn, we name the little horn or label little horn Syria for one reason. Because when the, when the, Alex, when, when the kingdom of Alexander the Great was broken, he had many generals that began to be, have the kingdom divided among them. But there was four predominant divisions, four predominant uh, segmentations of his kingdom. And they're seen right here. Turkey, which is more than Turkey, modern day Turkey. Macedonia, Syria, Egypt. And I believe that the Egypt, Egyptian empire extends beyond what we think of right now as Egypt proper. Because the Egyptian, ancient Egyptian empire went as far south as the lower parts of Ethiopia and extended all the way up to southern Tur Turkey, actually. But what happens, that's ancient. That's not during the time of this particular vision, okay? And what happens is we know that the Antichrist, the little horn, the one who makes great blasphemies against God, the little horn that, that actually commits the abomination that makes desolate the temple of God. In other words, he goes into the holies of holies, which has still got to be built yet, which right now there's a bunch of stuff going on with it right now. But remember, the holies of holies, the temple will be built in trouble sometimes. It'll be built in the midst of war, great conflict, in other words. He goes in and proclaims himself God. He says, I am God. It's pretty radical. Guess what? He's got an angel that has been bound in, in the pit. The scripture says that he was John says he was before my day. He is not now during my day, during the Roman Empire. 
and he shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. One of the things that we notice even in ancient in antiquity and in, in understanding uh, the various different reliefs and gods and images of gods is any time you saw anything with, an, with wings, it meant it was divine. It belonged to the spirit world. It was an angel. They saw that. Thus, when we look at, Babel, at the Babylonian Empire, we know that that pit, that angel that came up out of the pit was involved with him. And he was also involved with Greece, with Alexander the Great, and gave them their, their specific unique power, okay? The bear doesn't have wings, as it were. And then somebody said, well, how about the terrible beast? Well, you know, the, the fact of it is, is the terrible beast, Rome, is different from the 10 kings, the 10 horns, are the ten kingdoms that will rise up out of it. We looked at the terrible beast just so that we could understand the geographical relationship to what we're talking about. We look at the goat, once again, just so we can understand the geographical location so that we can begin to get an understanding of exactly what we're talking about. When we say Syria, we don't really mean Syria just as the little nation sitting over there all by itself. We're talk, it, that is actually misnamed. I didn't put that on there. It's the ancient kingdom of Assyria. Now, what the prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 10, also in Isaiah chapter 30, he begins to talk about Sennacherib in chapter 10. Very clearly, it's Sennacherib, which is the son of Sargon II, okay? Who is the son of uh, Azurbanipal, the first great, um, no, the great, great grandson of Azurbanipal, the first great king of, of ancient Assyria. Sennacherib comes down. Sargon ultimately finished up the job his dad started and ultimately destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. Because, of, uh, because why? It, the northern kingdom of Israel was given over to the worship of Nimrod, to Baal or Baal. They were completely given over to worshiping the angels involved with the wind, the angels involved with the water, the angels involved with the moon, the angels involved with the movement of the constellations and the angels involved with the sun that would literally manifest as the sun and they have images of these angels manifesting as the sun. So you're looking up towards the sky how, and, and these angels are all about deception and all of a sudden it's towards the sun and all of a sudden you see someone come down and personally manifest front, in front of you with a bright shining light of a face. And so their images show this face, show this manifestation. We call it myth, we call it legend, we call it folklore, but the reality of it, these things were going down. Satan is about deceiving, he's about dece a deceiver. The ultimate goal at that time was to get men to function and functionally interact specifically with demon spirits. Now it's a little bit different. It's to interact, uh, you know, in, in, in somewhat removed from the demon spirits in our intellectual society and in the, in, the, in the framework of what our culture is now. But then it was all about getting worship from men. What do I got to do to get men to bow down and worship me? So there was a, a level of deception that went on in order to accomplish that goal. Is demon worship still going on? Every time you sin, it's going on especially every sexual immorality. God says this, listen to me. God says this, you listen to me, listen to me. What I'm saying is more important than your math teacher, anybody else, you listen to me, okay? God says, you do whatever you wanna do. Go get drunk, go, go you know, kill somebody, go do whatever you wanna do. But if you commit sexual immorality, I'll destroy you in hell because it is the only sin against the temple. It's the only sin against the body. I said, I'll destroy you in hell. Ultimately, we try, to com we try to make it common, ordinary, a bodily function, just like eating. And no way. My goodness. Eating never created an eternal being. It is in a class all of its own. It is this wonderful realm, sacred realm that God gave to us to create that which never existed before and will exist forever. It's far more, we have reduced it to something that can be killed in the womb by the, by the millions. <laughs> Listen to me, people, because we live in a time of great deception. We live in perilous times. We live in a time of seducing spirits. We live in a time where people are in, saying they're interacting with God and they not. They're not interacting with God anymore than the northern kingdom of Israel was interacting with God when they worshiped Baal. But they said in their Baal worship that they were worshiping Yehoah and made groves unto him and ultimately brought all of that worship into the holies of holies. My goodness. 
so that they might worship all the host of heaven. Understand, when we're talking about worshiping the host of heaven, we're not just talking about the zodiac. We're not talking about worshiping, and we're not talking about astrology. Because from a biblical point of view, stars of heaven were always a means by which in, in antiquity, both biblically and secularly, to identify angels, especially biblically, to identify angels. When all the stars of, of, of heaven rejoiced in, in the day of its creation, speaking of the angels rejoicing over God creating the earth. And, and we, because we all we can think about is two plus two and, you know, whether or not, you know, and reciting the periodic table and all of our other things. We can't even begin to relate from a Western culture to this understanding of interacting with the spiritual world. But I'm telling you, it's on the rise. I'm telling you, witchcraft, new, all the new age doctors, the new age doctors are steeped in the religion of Nimrod. The Babylonian worship is steeped. It is, is very alive and apparent. Egypt became known as the kingdom of magic. When you ultimately, the kingdom literally of witchcraft, of the, of, of the, of the sorcerer and the soothsayer. When the Bible identifies witchcraft, when the Bible identifies uh, sorcery, where does it identify it first at? Egypt. Who? All of the soothsayers that stood uh, and, and the sorcerers that stood alongside of, jo uh, of Joseph when Joseph interpreted to the king the dream that he had. And their magicians, their magic people who are able to do all their various different interaction with demon spirits to find out unknown things. They, they say that there are great things. I don't know. I've never really proved this out, but I've seen writings on it that there are great mysteries hidden within the pyramid, the, circ the, the, the circumference of the earth, the, an astronomical unit, the distance of the earth to the sun. I mean, all that stuff would, you know, and they show, they show a, a math to support that. And if it is all true, I don't have a problem with it being true. I know I'm not proving it out, you know, but the bottom line of it is, I can easily see how this proven, it would have happened because they were interacting with angels. They taught, angels taught them how to do the magic, how to do the incantation, how to, how to interact with them so that they could give them information of what was going on in people's lives and what was going to happen as it were in the future because it was a future that they were dictating. Are you listening to me? It's never gone away. It's the whore that sits upon the beast. It's her religious practice. It combines all demon worship, all idolatry, all interaction as it were in the realm of having a, um, a go-between, a mediator between men and God. What's going to happen is this. Those under the rulership of the, of the Antichrist are going to kill her symbolically because there needs to be no more mediator. Satan is here. Lucifer's here. Baal showed up. Another name, Zeus. Alexander the Great believed he was the son of Zeus. Whether that's true or not, you know, whether he was somehow part angel and truly the seed of the serpent. He understood his purpose. His purpose was to unite all of the earth under the worship of his one God. Well, he had a plethora of gods, <laughs> okay? A pantheon of gods, but a special, especially of the God that he looked at as his father, which, which was another name for Satan, provably another name for Satan. I, mean, I, I, I pray that you handle these things, that you recognize. Quit being so discerning about all this other mess when in reality God has showed us so much about what Satan is doing, how he's doing it, so that you and I can see with clear, clarity to be able to have the ability and the insight and that, that much more the resolve to say, I'm not having nothing to do with you. When you make up your mind that you're, doing, dealing, you're having no more dealings with the demonic world, all of a sudden you begin to see. Stop practicing a little, you know, religious Christian Christianity and start getting in to sonship authority, to being who we're supposed to be, casting out devils, dealing with things as they're supposed to be dealt with. Okay. I'm just going to try to conclude all of this, okay, and, and w without getting into the next subject. And, um, you know, in, in, in the conclusion that I want to bring to you is this. The Lord opens up to us 
the understanding fundamentally of how Satan, the God of this world, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, has been ultimately executing his plan since the day of Adam. With two primary goals, with one primary goal, to make sure that man cannot be redeemed. To make sure that man can never go back with God. To make sure that man is imprisoned with him forever. What we do now is we begin to unfold the activity of that one purpose. Everybody everywhere is going to say, yeah, well, Satan's behind it. Fine. Now let's look at it a little bit more visibly, a little more clearly exactly how Satan is behind it because if people would understand a little bit more clearly of exactly how Satan is ultimately executing his program, I don't believe that people would so easily fall into his snare. Are you with me? Most important thing. The second thing that I want to show you is I want you to go back real quickly to this previous slide. You cannot really see this, but this beast with seven heads that come out of the sea of humanity in Revelation chapter 13, what, it, it, what happens is it shows all of the kingdoms except Rome really is here. Because it shows the mouth of a lion, Babylon, the feet of a bear, Media Persia, the body of a leper, the Grecian Empire, which more than, more than anything else embodies who the Antichrist is, the way his kingdom functions and operates. And you're looking at some pretty serious, ruthless stuff. Huh? They believed that Xerxes was half human, half angel. They believed that Xerxes could command the devils. And my, his, the works that he did, I know that there's, you know, modern day movies that try to bring to life what people would refer to as the myth and the legend behind him. They didn't, when they did Alexander the Great, they did not even come close to bringing to view the myth and the legend that is behind him. Nimrod, once again, they, uh, many believe that the myth and the legend around, centered around Hercules is, is, is really another name for Nimrod. But once again, they still do not show all that he was. See, they make Hercules this great hunter of animals. No, he's a hunter of men. They, they, they tone it down because ultimately they, over the years, they try to make it more acceptable, more modernized. They even need to make it more modernized to the Egyptians. They need to more modernize it to the Greeks because the Egyptians want to be all about love and peace and, you know, tranquility. That's why they have their, their witchcraft occult, wickery, the new age. When I went to Egypt and I was walking around, well, I just, you know, of course we went to Egypt to minister. We've been there a number of times ministry. And so I went to all of, not the pyramids, but to the old ancient ruins of Mims and the temples where you got people all over the world sitting in there doing their new age thing. Why? They believe they're bringing back the rise of the great religion and the great interaction with the spirits of nature that once existed so that once again we could have peace and tranquility in the earth. Peace and, you, you need to reread your history. Well, Satan's the arch, he's a, he's, a dece, he's, a de, he's a deceiver. Huh? Sikata la la ma siki para la la bo su para taya. Subrivetisi sata la nyami. Sikambla va tu su. You know, I think that more than anything else, I just, I, I labor for people to get this. And I can only give you so much in an hour. And I, I, I just pray that you will wrestle with these symbolisms. I pray that you will get into this thing and you will realize that all sin, all iniquity, is, it, it, it isn't just about people, you know, doing some pleasurable thing or just messing folks up temporarily or destroying the body. It is a sinister plot designed and orchestrated by Satan in his hordes of devils and fallen angels to overthrow men. We see in Revelation chapter 12 that he drew one third of the mighty host. He drew one third of the host of heaven. And one of the things that 
you know, I'm now right now emphasizing is the toes, part of clay and part of iron. They will not mix. They even as, uh, but they're part of clay and part of iron because as clay and iron cannot mix, neither can they mix with the seed of men. That's what it says. I'm going to go read it in Daniel chapter 8. I mean, forgive me, Daniel chapter 2. What is it? Verse 45, 44. Is it 44? What is it? Verse 44. I want, you to, I want you to get after this stuff. Or is it 46? Why do I keep bouncing back between the two? It must be 45 or something. So I just... These, huh? Yeah, keep going. You don't see the scripture I just quoted? In the 43. No, I, I think that I think it's so good to take the time and, and just read all these verses of Scripture because they're so impacted. It's just that if I do that, it's going to take me a lot longer to get through all the stuff that I'm laboring. And it's already, I already have to give every bit of anointing that I have to try to get people not to be destructive, to try to bust through the hindrances where people are just getting information and not allowing it to go into their spirit. You with me? Verse 43, I just want to read that. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not, is, is not mixed with clay. Once again, understanding that just as there was an interaction with the, the fallen angels, with the spirit world of men in the past, so in, the, so in the eighth kingdom, and remember, this isn't just the ten toes, this isn't just the seventh kingdom. When you look at the ten toes and you look at the ten horns, it's not just looking at the seventh kingdom. Many times the seventh and the eighth kingdom are, have to be seen together in order to communicate these things that the Lord wants to make known. So when he says, why can't the Lord just come out and make it clear? Why does he hide it to some degree in mystery? Because Father's only interested in people who are desperately hungry, who are desperately given over to knowing what's going on to be able to see. Everybody else can take it or leave it. You're not going to get it. 